All right. Today, I want to run through the third for response question from the 2021 AP Physics C Mechanics exam. And this problem has all sorts of little pitfalls in it. Honestly, if you hadn't practiced before the exam, you probably weren't going to figure out during the exam. Uh, what we have is a long, thin rod, and that long, thin rod is not a nice, neat, uniform rod. The mass per unit length of the rod is given by this equation, lambda is equal to gamma x squared. Now, I know you might look at this and think to yourself, oh, gamma, we, we haven't seen gamma ever. But realize it was just a constant. This was given in the problem where gamma was equal to 3m over l cubed. Uh, so this is just some constant value. And, and ultimately what this is telling us is that this rod has some linear mass density, that is its mass per length that is varying along its length. We can see that from this x squared right here. As we move farther along this rod, this rod becomes heavier and heavier and heavier. And so the first question they ask you to solve for is using calculus, show that the rotational inertia of this rod has some certain value. And this is not dissimilar to problems and videos that I've made in the past. If you want to click right up here, you can see where I derive the rotational moment of inertia for a rod around both its center and its end. But this is not a light, thin, uniform rod. So we have to deal with the fact that this rod is varying in mass as we move from the skinny end of this rod to the thick end of this rod. Now, I know it's not drawn that way, but that's what the equation tells us. So in order to do this, what we're going to do is we're going to look at just a single slice of the rod. And we're going to work out the mass of just this slice of the rod. Now, in order to look at just a, a single slice or at a single point along this rod, what I want to do is say we're only going to look at an infinitely thin slice of this rod. You could even go so far as to say that this infinitely thin slice of rod is some thickness, we'll call it dx thick, where it's infinitely thin. And that slice of rod is located somewhere along this entire rod, some distance x from the pivot point. So first we're going to go through and work out just the mass of a single slice of this rod. Now we know the mass per unit length is given by gamma, that's this term, multiplied by x squared. So if this is the mass per unit length, then the mass of a slice is going to be the mass per unit length multiplied by the length of that slice. Realize the length of that slice is dx. So over here, I'm gonna say the mass of a slice, I'm not gonna call it m, I'm gonna call it dm, because it's an infinitely small chunk of the total mass, which we know is m, I'll mark that right there, is gonna be equal to lambda, that's this term, multiplied by the length of our slice, that's dx. Now, humor me for just a second here, I'll show you why this works. If I was to go through and say integrate all of our little masses, all of the masses of each individual slice from a position of zero all the way out to a position of L, we should get the total mass of the rod. And that's exactly what happens. So follow along, let's see. The total mass is equal to the infinite sum of all of our dms. Or you could say that is the infinite sum from zero to L of this term here, 3m over l cubed, x squared, dx. We should get m. So the mass is equal to, carrying out our constants, we're gonna evaluate this. This is just really x squared dx. So when we integrate that, it's gonna be 1 third x cubed evaluated from zero to l. Realize, even though this problem looks kind of scary, the calculus on an AP physics test is almost never very difficult. It's just the power rule. Sometimes you see the chain roll, but not here. When I actually evaluate this, I get m is 3m over l cubed times one third l cubed and throw in the minus zero cubed if, if you really want or if your teacher's into that, whatever you do you. And we get a cancel party here and lo and behold, we get that mass equals mass. And while this isn't the answer to the question, realize 
everything after this line was was simply proving that, that we're on the right track here, okay? You didn't need to do this on the test. This is just me showing you, this does in fact work. I'm not crazy, this works. So now that we've got the mass of a slice, I wanna go back to inertia and rotational moment of inertia. And you'll remember the inertia of a particle is given by mr squared, where m is the mass of the particle and r is the distance between that particle and the axis of rotation. So here we have what is effectively a particle. All of this mass of this slice is all at a single radius. And so we can take the mass of our slice and use that as the mass of a particle, which we're gonna have rotate around this point P. So what we're gonna do next is work out the inertia of a slice. This is a slice of rod. Now this isn't gonna be the total inertia, this is just gonna be the inertia of just this teeny tiny little infinitely small slice. So I'm gonna call this not I, but DI, an infinitely small piece of the total inertia. I know some of you wanna call this a change in inertia, but it's, it's really just an infinitely small chunk. So this is going to be the mass of our slice, we can call that DM, multiplied by its radius, that's X squared. Now you'll see here, I have a term or an expression for dm. So I'm gonna substitute that in right here. And this is gonna give me di is equal to 3m over l cubed, x squared dx multiplied by x squared. And the big screw up here that I'm sure people are gonna do on the test or did on the test is they forgot to put in both x squareds. But all this reduces down, if you do it correctly, to this term. So this is the inertia of a single slice. So if I wanna know the total inertia of the entire rod, all I need to do is add up the inertia of each individual slice all the way along the rod. So the total inertia is going to be the infinite sum from a position of zero here, or an x of zero, to an x that is equal to L. So I'm integrating from zero to L, all of my di's, that's 3m over L cubed, x to the fourth, dx. Realize this dx is telling us we're integrating with respect to x. So everything in these parentheses is simply a constant. So integrating this, I'm gonna get this term. And when I evaluate this at l and zero, that's gonna leave me with And this cancels out and leaves us with this term, exactly what we we're supposed to get. It even said on the test that we were supposed to show that the rotational moment of inertia was equal to this value. So check, we win. And that is part A. Again, if you wanna see me solve more problems for the inertia of a particular shape, uh, I've got several videos on the rotational moments of inertia about uh, a rod on its end or its center or even other shapes as well. You just click right up here. Next, we we're asked to go through and solve for the center of gravity of this non-uniform rod. Now remember, this rod is very thin at one end and thick at the other end, kind of like a wedge. Uh, and if you wanna see me go through and actually work out the center of gravity of a wedge, you can just click right up there. I've got a video on that. But this rod, because this mass per unit length is a function of x squared, means the result here is not strictly the same as a wedge. So I'm gonna go through and show you exactly how all this works when dealing with a, a rod here. And the nice part about this is that in working out the center of gravity of a rod, we've actually already done some work that's gonna help us out over here, and I'll show you how. When looking at the center of gravity, you will remember that the center of mass is equal to this equation. Uh, and you can turn both the numerator and denominator here into summations, and that's exactly how we're gonna treat this. We're gonna look at this as an infinite sum of infinitely small little masses. Because each mass or each slice along this rod is at its own position. So what we're gonna choose to do is go back to our original slice here, and we're gonna look at the mass of that slice and its position. And we're simply gonna say that is some mass at a particular position and we're going to integrate all of those masses at their positions. So really what we're gonna do is we're gonna say the center of mass is equal to an infinite sum of infinitely small masses at their discrete 
positions over the total mass. And we already showed the total mass here is M. And it was given to you in the problem anyway. So our center of mass along the x-axis is going to be the mass of a slice. That's this term multiplied by its position, that is x. And we're gonna integrate all of those slices at their little positions from an x of zero to an x of L. That is to say, we're gonna integrate along the entire rod. Then we're gonna divide this by the entire mass. Now you'll see immediately, this x is gonna substitute in here, uh, and we've got some constants here, so I'm simply gonna rewrite this just to clean it up a little bit. And we'll get a little bit of a cancellation here with our mass. And in taking the integral of this function here, we'll get, which we're then gonna evaluate from zero to L. And, in, and you'll see this L to the third and L to the fourth are gonna partially cancel out. So we're left with, the center of mass along the x-axis is three quarters of the length of the rod. That is to say, the center of mass is gonna show up right about here. That is the answer to part B. All right, now the first two parts of this problem were, were actually pretty difficult, uh, but much in, in the style of AP physics, uh, this, this last question looks like it's just gonna pummel you the whole way through, but we get on to part C and it's actually not too bad. Uh, they ask you what's gonna happen to the, the rotational moment of inertia of this rod. They said for an axis perpendicular to the page is the value of rotational inertia around P going to be greater than, less than, or equal to the value of rotational inertia around the rod's center of mass, which we found to be right here. In short, what this means is if we rotate the rod around this point right here, is it going to have a different rotational moment of inertia than if we rotate the rod around right here? And the answer to this problem is actually pretty simple, and it goes back to the parallel axis theorem. The parallel axis theorem says that the total rotational moment of inertia of any rotating object is equal to its rotational moment of inertia around its center of mass plus some value md squared, where m is the mass of the object and d is the distance between the axis of rotation and the center of gravity or the center of mass, which in this case is the distance from here to here. Really what this tells us is that the rotational moment of inertia of an object is minimized when we rotate an object around its center of mass. If we rotate it around any other point, this value d is going to be non-zero, and therefore, rotating an, any object around an axis which does not pass through its center of mass is going to cause that total rotational moment of inertia to increase. Now, if you want to see this proved using calculus, I've got a video up here uh, that shows the rotational moment of inertia is minimized when we rotate an object around its center of mass. So to go back and actually answer the question which AP was asking on this test, and that is, is the rotational moment of inertia around P greater than, less than, or equal to the rotational moment of inertia around the center of mass? And the answer is, it's greater than. And in short, or to justify your answer, we're simply saying that the farther away the axis of rotation is from the center of mass, per the parallel axis theorem here, the greater the rotational moment of inertia will be. Next, you are asked to sketch on these, these axes for both torque and angular velocity as functions of time. I should put that in there. Uh, you're asked to sketch the torque as a function of time and the angular velocity as a function of time. And so to understand what's going on here, it's important to go back and remember what torque even is or how to calculate torque. You remember torque in two dimensions is R, F, sine theta. If you want to make this three dimensions and turn it into a cross product, great. You're going to find it reduces down to this though. Um, so this torque equation, we've got a radius vector from our axis of rotation to where gravity is acting on this rod. And remember, gravity is going to act on the center of gravity. Call that the force by gravity at some distance that is the distance from here to here. And the angle theta here is the distance between these two vectors. So as this rod swings downward,
we see that the radius vector is going to remain the same distance or the same length. That is to say the distance from the axis of rotation to the center of gravity is going to remain a constant distance. And the force by gravity, mg, is going to remain constant. But this angle is going to change. Now, whether you want to use the obtuse angle or the acute angle, that's up to you. It doesn't matter because when we plug in those values here into the, our torque equation, what we're going to find is as this rod swings downward, this term right here, sine theta, is going to change. It's going to decrease because the closer and closer this rod gets to vertical, the less torque there is on this rod by gravity. So we know that the torque is going to start at a maximum and finish at zero. I say finish, that is when the rod's gonna be straight up and down. But the question is, what's this look like as we go from here to here? And I want you to think about the motion or the kinematics of this rod. At first, the rod is not going to be swinging very fast. And as it swings farther and farther down, effectively what we have is a conversion of potential energy into kinetic energy, which really means the rod's gonna be swinging faster and faster. So at first, the rod isn't going to change its angle very quickly. Or if you want to nerd it up, you could say your d theta over dt is not going to change very rapidly. Really what that means is the rod isn't going to be moving very quickly at first, and then as time goes on, it's going to speed up. So at first, the torque isn't going to change very rapidly, and as time goes on, it's going to change faster and faster. So we see a concave down arc like this. Now, Having thought through all of this, our angular velocity is pretty simple now. Our angular velocity is going to start at zero, and as time goes on, the angular velocity is going to approach a maximum value, and it's steadily going to level off. And I'll show you, or explain to you, why this is. And really, AP was trying to get you to explain this in the next part of this question, and that was question, or part E, where they said, what is happening to the angular acceleration of the rod as the rod swings downward? Well, we know that this torque is going to vary as a function of RF sine theta. And we know torque is also equal to I alpha. That is the rotational moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. So you can see the angular velocity is shown as, as leveling off. And this really goes back to the fact that torque is not only equal to RF sine theta, it's also equal to I alpha. And what this means is that as, as theta approaches zero degrees or 180 degrees, depending on which or how obtuse you want to be up here, um, this torque value is going to approach zero, therefore alpha is going to approach zero. And remember, just like in linear kinematics, the relationship between angular velocity and angular acceleration is angular acceleration is simply the derivative or the slope of angular velocity. That is telling us this is going to approach a horizontal asymptote. And that's exactly what part E was getting at. Part E was simply asking, as the rod rotates downward, is the magnitude of the angular acceleration going to increase, decrease, or not change? And the answer was, it's going to decrease and even approach zero. Now, once the rod starts swinging up the other side of this, this arc, that would change. But at the very lowest point, the angular acceleration was zero. So this is the third question off the 2021 AP Physics C free response. And on that note, that's all for now.